to give a little review on Nehemiah, the wall has been rebuilt. The exiles have returned. The people then gathered on the first day of the first month for the Feast of Tabernacles or Trumpets and asked Ezra to read the word of God to them. And when they heard the word, they were hit between the eyes, hit in the heart, so to speak, because they were grieving the sin within them. But then they were told that the day, that day, was holy, right? The Feast of Trumpets is not a, a, a day to grieve, but to rejoice. And so as we last left off, we saw that their grieving turned into celebration. They had this great festival with eating and happiness. I'll turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 8. We're going to read, finish off the rest of the chapter there, verses 13 to 18, and then we'll open in a word of prayer before we continue looking at God's word together. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 13 to 18 says this. On the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtles, palms, and other leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. And so the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in the booths. For from the days of Jeshua, the sons of Nun, to that day, the people of Israel had not done so. And there was very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. They kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was solemn assembly according to the rule. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the scriptures. And we thank you for the book of Nehemiah and, and how your word constantly reminds us of how much we uh, need you to keep our focus on you. And I pray that as we are a month into this new year, that we have found ourselves in your scriptures. Help us, O oh Lord, in our resolve to read the Bible, uh, to study, to, to love, and, and pray over the Bible. And I ask that as we have our Bibles open this morning, that uh, we would once again read, uh, mark, learn, inwardly digest your word spoken to us. And that through your word, it would, it would speak to us by name. It would speak to us as a church and, and as individuals, that it would transform us. That we would be excited to uh, share your good news with others for your glory. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, blog from the Oxford Review was written on how people learn information in an organization or company. And specifically, the article focused on the question, at what point can a supervisor be confident that an employee has really learned something? And according to that Oxford review, you can really say that you've learned something when you can repeat it when you understand it, when you teach it to others, and ultimately when you can do something with it. Did you catch that last phrase? You have really learned something when you can do something with it. 
And that's the message of our passage here this morning. Up to this point in Nehemiah chapter 8, God's people have been gathering around God's word. And now we see them do God's word. Over in the New Testament, James has says something like this. It says in James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. You can turn there with me for a moment, read along. It says this. James chapter 1, verses 22, 25 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And that's our goal here at Marysville Community Church, doing God's word, actually living it out. That's an action word, right? Living it out, doing. Something is happening here, right? The foundation is already laid by the Lord before us, the disciples before us. And now we want to continue to build upon that. And and we do that by God's word. Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And so as we spend time with him, ask in our daily walks, right? Wherever we may be, ask the Lord to do his building through us instead of us doing what we think is right and best. We need to source the right tools. What we think specifically determines our behavior. The right tool for building well beginning begins with thinking right thinking about what is true what is noble what is pure what is lovely what is admirable what is excellent what is praiseworthy right that's that's uh, philippians philippians chapter 4 verse 8 says finally brothers whatever is true whatever is honorable whatever is just whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things, right? 1 Corinthians 3 chapter, or 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 9 to 11 says, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's Building according to the grace of, of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. We want to be known as doing, building upon God's word and not merely hearing it. It's the kind of culture that we want to uh, strengthen Marysville Community Church so that the world can see in us uh, the difference that resting in and following Jesus and his word really makes. It's when we're living out that word, we can then say, we have learned it, right? Last week, we ended in in verse 12, which said, And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. The Day of Atonement was celebrated on the 10th day of the month and the Feast of Tabernacles from the 15th day to the 21st day. And this meant that the leaders had only a few days available for getting the word out to the Jews, to the surrounding villages. Verse 13 describes the scene the very next day, right? What does it say? On the second day, the heads of the fathers, the house of all the people, and the 
with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra, the scribe, in order to study the words of the law. And we see here, right, that the people came back on the second day. But it's a specific group of people. Who, who are these people? Men. Leaders of the family. They, why did they come back? The priests and the Levites came together with the heads of the families to study God's word carefully. These would have been the men who were primary, who had primary responsibility to study God's word carefully so that they could go and spread the knowledge of God's word throughout their families, throughout their clans, and to the next generation so that they could be what? Doers of of God's word. These individuals were concerned to give their attention to the word. They would have been asking Ezra, hey, hey Ezra, what does this mean here? How does this apply? How should it change us? What should we be doing with this word here? This is James 1.22, right? This is doing we haven't, much, we haven't spent much time on Ezra himself, but what we know is that his ministry was successful. How do we know that? Well, turn back to Ezra chapter 7, verses 9 to 10. It says this, For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up, to, go up from Babylonia. And on the first day of the first month, he came to Jerusalem for the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. We know from the Old Testament book that bears his name that many practical and urgent matters demanded his attention, often, right? But he nevertheless gave the proper priority to study. More than that, he observed the right order of things. Study, followed by personal obedience, leading to effective teaching of others. And before he instructed others, what did he do? He obeyed the word himself. This is one of the goals of our church through, well, we've got men's breakfast. We've got lots of different uh, ministries here, but specifically I'm looking at the men, the leaders, the, the ones that are responsible for our families. Men's breakfast that we have here. This is specifically for us as dads. Men of the church, come. Be fed physically, right? We've got great food often cooked here, but more importantly, be fed spiritually allow the word to impact you the bible teaches us in ephesians chapter 5 verse 23 and and ephesians 6 verse 4 that the lord has made you head of your families there's responsibility that means we have this awesome privilege and responsibility to study god's word together to teach our children grandchildren other men around us to be Doers like these men here in Nehemiah before us. John chapter 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. 2 John chapter 1, verse 6 says, And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. Last men's breakfast, for example. Lyle was able to break down in love what I was asking the men and, and Caden, who was there with us. God's light was shining through. He had his iPad that he was able to communicate back and forth. There was this joy. He understood. We understood. It was an amazing time together. And the word was broken down in such a way that he was responding to it. The question is, 
How are we doing in this, right? And I can guarantee you that when you attend upon the instruction of the Word of God with that kind of heart attitude that was displayed, then you will begin to see big changes in your life. If you listen carefully to the word and and can give your attention to it, then if you come with that kind of expectant heart, your life will be impacted in a way that is transforming. That's what we want to see. But if we gather upon the listening of the word of God in such a way that our hearts are hardened or closed in any way, then it's just like a dripping tap. On a piece of slate. And as the priests and the Levites, the heads of the families, are studying God's word carefully, they make a surprising discovery. What is that? What do we see here? Well, we'll get to how many times, right? How many times in our lives have have we read through a portion of God's word over and over? We see. What do we see? We see that we miss something, something big. We've read through this passage many times, didn't pick up on it. But it also shows that the Lord is opening our eyes to deeper truths that we couldn't see before. Psalm 119 verse 18 says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your out of your law. And that's what's happening here. Verses 14, 15. What did they find? They found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. During the seven days of the feast, the the Jews lived in booths made of branches and and usually built on the flat roofs of their their houses. Uh, It was a time for looking back and remembering what the nation, remembering the nation of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, right? Looking back to, to when they walked, followed Moses, followed God through the wilderness. But it was also a time of looking around at the harvest blessings, right? From the hand of God, all that he has provided them. And it was also a time to look ahead to the glorious kingdom God promises his people in Israel. We see that in Zechariah chapter 14. There's a bunch of verses there. What do we see happening here? Well, we see that they've come across Leviticus chapter 23, verses 33 to 43, where God speaks to Moses, gives him the commands, and they realize that there was a festival that they had been neglecting. It is the Feast of Tabernacles, or or Feast of Booths, which is described in full detail in this passage. Leviticus at the end, verse 23, 42, 43 says, You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. The leaders of the families read this, right? Right? They look at one another with blank faces, right? They haven't been, they haven't been celebrating the Feast of Booths. They look down at their sundial watches, uh, their paperous calendars, right? And they go, oh no, we don't have much time here to be prepared. The feast starts in two weeks. We got a lot of work to do. They're reading God's word here and they're saying to one another, we better do this. Right? What would we do in a situation like this? Right? If we're honest, 
Right? Most of us would delay, look at the command here. Ah, I don't know. I don't... No, this is good information here, but I don't have time. I don't, I don't want to... I don't want to do what God's word says. We'll do it next year when we have more time to prepare, right? How many times have we said that in our lives? Said the same thing, right? In a different way. I'll, I'll follow God, right, in this area of my life when things settle down over here for me. I'll give more financially. I'll serve the church or I'll become a member of the church I'll join Tuesday morning prayer time, men's breakfast, or, or ladies' Bible study when I get this right over here in my life. But I'm too busy for that right now. i got too many things on the go. But look how they respond here in Scripture. Verse 16. So the people went out, brought them, and made booths for themselves, each on his roof, and in their courts, and in the courts of the house of God, and in the square at the water gate, and, and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. What happens? Right? They drop everything. Set aside every other responsibility, and then obey God's word immediately. Their obedience was obvious in three areas. It was obvious in their backyards, right? On their roofs, in their courtyards. It was clear in the courts of the house of God. And it was clear in the public square at the water gate and at the gate of Ephraim. That's all over. Immediate. When looking at this, I'm reminded of Abraham's obedience in Genesis. It's, it's shown in different areas for sure. Chapter 12, chapter 22. Then we look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 10. And it talks about Abraham's obedience. And it says this. By faith, Abraham, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that was that has foundations who des whose designer and builder is God. Abraham demonstrates one of the greatest examples of faith in the Bible. He believed against all odds and he endured in his faith. Abraham's faith was obedient, believing faith, right? A faith that was genuinely obeyed and believed God. And when God called Abraham, what did he do? He acted immediately. He did not hesitate, argue, question, or waver. He simply obeyed. Elster Begg says, can you imagine? Right? He's, he's looking at this. You go home in the afternoon. You, you go home this afternoon, right? After service this morning, gather up all the sticks, all the brush from all the wooded areas that are around your house. And you start building a little porch out front, a little shack on top of your roof, right? Monday morning, you get a call from the city of Kimberley here, and they ask, can you ex explain what this is all about, Right? You need to build, you need a permit to build structures here. And you reply, oh, well, oh yeah. It's about the fact that the people in the past lived in Egypt. God redeemed them, brought them into the promised land. Uh, we're celebrating that, right? It's just for a week. We'll take it all down. I did something similar for my dad uh, building a ramp to our uh, travel trailer in the front yard the other summer uh, when he was having troubles uh, walking and 
and uh, so he could get it out of it e easier and and uh, in and out and some thought I was crazy building this structure this ramp to my trailer actually that's a good question <laughs> how crazy are you prepared to be for Jesus Christ people should be able to say hey there's something different about you guys as Christians there's something different about us why well first Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says gives us a great answer it says this but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Isn't that amazing? Well, looking at this passage here in Nehemiah, Alistair Begg says the impact of these things upon their lives and upon their children must have been dramatic. Right? Right? come home from Sunday get your kids or your family and start building structures on your roof in your front yard right your son comes up to you dad I could just see Noah doing this right dad do we have to build build it up on the roof all my friends at school are going to laugh at me right What's my answer supposed to be? Yes, son. We do. Right? If we're in Nehemiah's time, this is walking in obedience to the Lord. Today we have different ways of walking in obedience to the Lord and his word. John chapter 15 verses 9 to 11 shares on this. When we obey God's when we obey God, imitating the holiness of Christ by following his commandments, we unite ourselves to him. And therefore, we are immersed in his love and experience unworldly joy. I'll share four simple reasons why we can rejoice in obeying the Lord. I won't go into in big de detail, just glance over it. First, Obedience produces a blessed life, a pure heart. Second, obedience keeps you from harm, keeps you on the right path. Thirdly, obedience pleases the Father. As a child of God, you want to please Him. When we walk with Him, when we honor Him. Fourthly, those who love Him obey our obedience to Christ is an expression of our love for Christ moving on let me ask you this <laughs> have you ever owned a cat or dog that started hacking in the middle of the night <laughs> right what do you do you act quickly, right? You jump out of bed, hopefully not into what they just hacked up. Uh, you get them outside immediate, immediately, right? <laughs> well, it's the same thing with obeying God's word. We should be leaping up to obey God's word immediately. And the question that comes to mind here is, where have I, where have we been delaying obedience to God's word? Perhaps some categories to consider our, our worship, maybe it's community, mission. Is there a way that we're delaying obedience in our love for God? Your love and commitment to others in the church. Love for your non-Christian friends, neighbors, right? When the Lord places it on our hearts, when we have that urge turning right inside of us, here's a suggestion. Just do it. And do it quickly for the Lord. Here's why this is so important. 
If the dads, if the men of the families hadn't gone that second day to listen to Ezra, to understand the word so that they could then apply it to themselves, teach and instruct their families, they would have never shared in the celebration of the feast. Verse 17 says, And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in the booths. For from the days of Jeshua, the son of Nun, to the day the people of Israel had not, to that day the people of Israel had not done so. And there was very great rejoicing. Everyone was there. It was a huge celebration. And Ezra continued to read and explain the word of God. Without it, there is no celebration. Verse 18, and day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of, of the law of God. They kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. At the heart of the Feast of Tabernacles, or booths, was a water drawing ceremony we see this back in isaiah chapter 12 we also see it in john chapter 7. one priest would lead a a parade of god's people to the temple holding two golden picture pictures of uh, one with water full of, full of water one full of wine which he would then pour into two empty bowls on the altar it was a drink offering you might wonder, well, why water? Right? So simple. Well, water was scarce in the wilderness when God miraculously provided for his people as they wandered in the desert, in the wilderness. But there's also a deeper reason. If you turn over to Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25, 27, it says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. And I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. And give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And be careful to obey my rules. Ezekiel here is promising that coming is one day that the Lord himself will pour out the water of the Holy Spirit. Cleanse the people from their sins and put his law in their hearts so that we will never have to thirst again. Right? That's what this feast is all about. Jesus even celebrated this feast in John chapter 7 verses 37 to 39, which says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whose, whom those who believed in him were to receive for as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, we know that Jesus has fulfilled what is Ezekiel promised back in the Old Testament. All who come to him with the burden of their sin and the yoke of God's law will be washed clean and have the springs of eternal life flowing through their hearts, through the Holy Spirit that Jesus pours out on all who believe. And obeying requires doing God's word. We all fall short. Our souls are parched. And without him, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. But God, in his mercy, sent his son who lived, died, rose again to deliver, to pour out the water of God's Spirit to forgive us of our sins, refresh forever, quench our parched souls, strengthen us to do God's Word. And like those before us, we are truly dependent on God's Word. What are we to do? Well, 
We lather, we rinse, we repeat. Read the text. Explain its meaning. Pray that the Lord will apply his word as he promises and go home and do it again. That's it. Get in God's word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your words here in Nehemiah to us. And the reminder to develop an attitude of obedience to your word, to your will. And an increasing trust in your word. To act upon what we have learned as, as we read it. And Father, may you help a, each one of us grow in grace and to develop this right godly practice and, and scripture purpose in life. So that you are lifted up in our lives for others to see. Father, may we learn to praise you without ceasing and, and to develop an attitude of prayerfulness so that you may increase and we decrease. Father, refresh our spirits as we, as we prepare for communion. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.